fuss this morning? Did you hear the good version of it? <laughs> Amen. So anybody with a testimony or special today? In this 30 foot whale, 30 foot now, I showed you 30 feet. Mm -hmm. This guy was probably five foot tall. There's plenty of room for me in this fish. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Dimensionally, if he's 30 feet long, he's at least 12 feet tall. Well, I don't see anybody in here that's over 12 feet. Any of us could stand it. So when the Bible tells me that the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah and he spent three days and three nights in there, this is living proof that that happened. Right. Amen? Right. And I'm just blessed to hear that story. <laughs> Aren't you? Yeah. Praise God. No wonder he vomited. No wonder he vomited. <laughs> me? He talking about me. <laughs> we talk about fish back here every, day, every Sunday anyway, don't we? Yes. There you go. Just praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. And you know, 
to some of our songbooks. I don't know if Barb says it or not. I, 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 well, I won't get on to whoever wrote ours, but uh, there's a song, an old song, that says, now for sinners such as I, but it used to say for such a worm as I. Yeah. And so I don't know which one it says in ours, but it means the same thing.
But anyway, I feel like the Lord really blessed that situation. And I just thank him for that because, you know, the, I know they're not in church. I know that the dad was raised in church by his grandma. And she's passed on. But I just want to give, God, give God glory for dismantling that because children are so impressionable, you know.
exception. And it, it happens, you know, well, well with exception, because we're on lights. But, you know, uh, I'm real techie, so I was looking around all around the place. Well, we couldn't find it on my phone, but it's on Rhonda's phone. So uh, we're on Rhonda's phone again today. So if, if you folks at home are having trouble finding us, look for Rhonda or me, but I think it's coming through. The, the group, I think it's working. I think it's on now. <laughs> and uh, so I'm grateful for that. But, you know, but we have all these things that happen day by day. And, and the Lord's with us, and that's good. Yes, amen. Anybody else? Well, I want to say I'm thankful we celebrated our 49th anniversary this week. And uh, <laughs> we had 49 years, you know. I guess we uh, both deserve a medal, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I'm just thankful how God brought us together and, you know, He's still with us day by day, and if he wasn't, you know, then we might not be, have been to get, still be together. But some of you got more, have been long, together longer than that. And I, I'm, but I'm just thankful how God, how God works in our, all of our lives. You know, just the, uh, you know, your spiritual part, your physical part, and your financial part, and your, uh, Lord, your uh, relationships. So I'm thankful how God works in that. chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 14. And also, if you'd like to look at two passages, you can also look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 10. And once you've found, found those, we'll read them here in just a minute. But I was thinking about the healing power of worship and, and what happens to us in that. And the Lord is here today. You can tell that. It's very obvious that he is. And you know, he's promised that. We shouldn't be surprised at that. He promises us where two or three are gathered together in his name. And there he is in the midst. And so we're here together in his name today. And I want to talk about the healing power of humility. Now, I have a, a series of books that I'm writing. And it's... Uh, based on that first book that some of you got that had the printer's errors and stuff like that in it. And, uh, but anyway, it's based on that. That book was divided into six parts, and they'll take each of those parts and get them out with a different book for each part. So the first one is Leaving, and it's the acronym LOVING, The Loving Way to Successful Marriage. first one is Leaving. The second one is Overcoming. The third one is Valuing, and that's the one we're coming to uh, now, next one in the list, valuing and loving. Uh, I is for intimacy. I should have done that when we were doing Song of Solomon, right? And then we had the N. N is for needs meeting, meeting each other's needs. And G stands for giving. So anyway, today we're talking about valuing. And in order to do the valuing, you can't do that if you are lifted up with pride yourself. And so that brings me to the idea of humility. And so there is the healing power of humility. Now, there were two families that lived next to each other. And uh, they were kind of in the suburbs, and their houses joined. There's a hedge between them. They couldn't see each other, though. On one day... The wife of one family, her name was Marge, was out in the yard, and she was over on that edge, and she just didn't want to be around anybody. And then the husband of the other family, he was out in his yard, and he was on the other side of his yard. They both didn't know that they were outside. And, and they didn't really know what danger uh, was lying in their houses, uh, and especially their spouses didn't know. But Marge, she was outside, and she had these feelings. She said, oh, 
I can't do anything right. He never stands up for me. And it seems like he always takes me for granted. It would be nice to hear, you know, thank you. And uh, it would be nice to know that you're doing a good job. He doesn't notice when I try to look good for him. We were going out to eat the other night, and I worked for, seemed like an hour. And I got out there, and he didn't even notice. And then she thought, he is so arrogant. And he never apologizes for anything. He never supports me when the children put me down. And so she had these feelings over on this side, and then Mark is out over here, and he says, she doesn't seem to think I know anything. Now, I'm always taken for granted. And she never says anything good about me in public. Never around my friends. And she never apologizes for anything. <laughs> and she never stands up for me whenever the children push back to me. And it would be the nice to hear the words, thank you, just once in a while. Today I want to look at the healing power of humility and look at two verses of scripture to begin with. We're going to have more. But James chapter 4 verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. this is a very famous verse, those of us that want revival. Those of us that we're concerned about our nation, very famous verse for us. The principles in it, according to the word of God, should work. <laughs> they not only should work, they will work if they're done correctly. But he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, humility will play a, a large part in healing our land, our marriages, and our lives. So we're going to look at the importance of humility, examples of humility, commands concerning humility, and the most important requirement of humility for us all. And first of all, the importance of humility. Now, the man said that there's one thing that I'm better at than anybody else. That's being humble. <laughs> and then, you know, I was talking about writing a book. So I think, I think I'll write a book on humility, and I'm sure it will be a bestseller. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, so we think about this, but, but pride brings pain, the importance of humility. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9 says, It is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in the White House, or a contentious woman, some versions say. But you had, in both households there, you had people that seemingly, their spouses, were lifted up with pride in some ways, and contention, and all that. Now, the writer of Proverbs was so concerned about this that uh, uh, 10 chapters later he wrote, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. And in Proverbs 25, it says, it is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman and in a white house. Now ladies, I'm not trying to pick on you, but it's in there three times, so... Uh, just take it for whatever reason it's in there for that many times. Proverbs 16, 18 tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now there was a time whenever God commanded King Saul uh, to take his army against the Amalekites and to utterly destroy them, to utterly wipe them out. Well, he sent his army out. But instead of following God's command completely, he was supposed to destroy everything. But instead, they took some of the spoils. Instead, they were even supposed to kill the livestock. You say, well, why would they do all of that? Well, if you got rid of all of that, of all of that sin, there could be no influence on anybody else. And you say, well, what's the fairness of that? Well, the fairness is that God knows the heart. 
and God does know the heart. And uh, so anyway, they were just a lost people that were never going to repent and never were going to come back. And so God was going to wipe them out. And uh, he told Saul to do that, but Saul didn't. And Samuel came back, and uh, Saul greeted him and said, Well, I have done the command of the Lord. And Samuel said, Oh, what's that I hear? And so he heard some cows moving in the distance. And then he heard some goats and sheep. And said, so what's this bleeding of goats and sheep that I hear? And uh, Saul said, well, I saved some of them out. And he kept the king alive. You know? And uh, But he had disobeyed God. And God prompted Samuel to say this. He said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? That's when you were little in your own eyes. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? So pride brings pain and pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall but secondly humility though on the other hand brings joy uh, in first peter chapter 5 verses 5 through 7 we read this likewise you younger people submit yourselves to your elders all, all of your parents are really glad for me reading this verse and uh, yeah, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. And so if you have cares and you would like to bring them to God, in order to be able to do that, he says for you to humble yourself under his mighty hand. And not only will you feel better and will things get better, but you will be lifted up in due time. Humility brings joy. Second Chronicles 7, 14, we already read it. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So humility brings joy. Humility brings healing, healing of our land, healing of our marriages, healing for our lives. In John chapter 9, uh, Jesus had been with the disciples and they came to this certain place. And in uh, verse 33, when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent. Because on the road, they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. I have a whole message on that. And it's called The Secret of Greatness. And to boil it all down into one sentence, the secret of greatness is humble service without thought of reward. And so he was talking about humbly serving others. Now we look at some examples of humility. First of all, we look at Moses. And Moses a great deliverer. You know, he came to the Red Sea and God allowed the sea to part in front of him. And they all went through on dry ground. What a great miracle that God had done. And Moses was leading millions of people. Uh, it doesn't seem like it. You think about him like being out in the desert and all that with sheep and everything. But 
he was leading at least a million and a half or two million people, maybe more. And he was leading them. And in Numbers chapter 12, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek, or very humble. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Now what I want us to understand from that is, that humility does not mean being a doormat. Now some of what I'm going to talk about here is about us being humble. Humble ourselves in the sight of God, and we should. And whatever God uh, does for us, and we feel our unworthiness, and we can fall down before him, and we can confess our own unworthiness. And we should be humble in our dealing with others. But it is not weakness. See, that just rhymes with meekness. But Moses was a very strong individual. In fact, he had a problem with anger. <laughs> and uh, he didn't get to go on the promised land because one time he got angry and he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. But it doesn't mean being a doormat. And Moses, though, was a very humble man, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. But who could be the best example? of humility and have our Lord Jesus. We know that he left heaven's glory. He came to this earth. He was born as a baby. He was raised as a human being. He knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew what it was like to be thirsty. He knew what it was like to be criticized. He knew what it was like for people to spit on him. He knew what it was like for people to nail him to a cross. And he had all the power and he was the one that spoke the worlds in existence. Can, can you imagine that? that? There was one time before they took him to the cross. He, it, that couldn't have happened unless he allowed it himself. Because one time before they took him to the cross, the soldiers approached. And I won't say that God ever forgets, but in that moment, Jesus did not restrain his power. And they were going to go get him. And it was like this force field, you know, this science fiction around him. Like it was there, and they just bounced off of it, and they fell to the ground because of the power of Jesus. Humility has strength and power under control, and Jesus was our example of that. Now, in John, 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us, that we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So we have the importance of humility and the, the uh, examples of humility. And, uh, you, one guy said, uh, there's something I can really brag about. That's about how humble I am. <laughs> there's a, another man that was given a medal for humility, but they had to take it away from him because he kept wearing it. I said, I, I am so perfect. I only have four flaws. And he named two of them. And he said, well, the third one is I can't count. <laughs> I said four, and he can only remember three. All right. Let's look at some commands related to humility. And let's start out talking about marriage. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 32 and 33 said, this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Some versions say reverence her husband. And so I'm talking about in marriage there, we need to value each other. And we need to help each other feel valued. And I want you to know today that you are valued. You are so valuable in God's sight that he sent his son. You're so valuable in the sight of the Lord that he was willing to take your sin and put it upon himself. And if you will come to him in repentance and faith, he will give you the gift of eternal life. And you can spend eternal life with him. He offers you heaven. You are that valuable. But, speaking here of marriage, 
The husband is commanded to love the wife. Now, maybe we're not naturally good at that, and that's why it's a command to us. We have to, in an act of the will, show love. All spectrums of it. Coming in that mushy side and that romantic stuff there, and that stuff we're not good at. And maybe we need to pick up on some of that. Because God tells us that we ought to do that. He tells us the wives that they ought to respect their husbands. And that's because husbands have a great need to be respected. Now, obviously, the wife wants to be respected. The husband wants to be respected. Obviously, the wife wants to be loved. And obviously, the husband wants to be loved. But Emerson Egridge's wrote a book called Love and Respect. And uh, he did surveys. And, and I've done informal surveys like this on a couple of crowds that I've been with, and we've made lists. And uh, whenever we came up with our list, we said, uh, okay, how many of you men put affection and romance up higher than love and respect? And lots of times there'd be no hands that go up. I said, well, if you did it the other way, yeah, all the hands went up. We'd ask it about the ladies, the flip side there, how many of you put affection and romance higher than love and respect? And generally all the ladies' hands would go up. So God knew what he was doing <laughs> when he was writing the scripture. He was commanding these things. But don't you see that both of those things show us that we value our spouses, or we should. A lot of things come in. Pride can come in and keep us from doing that. Well, then in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, we are told to not grieve the Spirit of God. We're told that whenever we become children of God, we get His Spirit. So we need to be saved and we need to receive His Spirit. We are told to be filled with the Spirit of God. And in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, you remember when I talked about Moses back there? In one version, it says he was more meek than anyone else. Another version said he was more humble than anyone else. In this one, it says gentleness. In another version, it says meek, which means humble. Humility. Humility is a part of the spirit. So we've looked at that. So uh, thinking about this, we uh, talked about the importance of humility. And we talked about some examples of humility. And we talked about some commands related to humility. But I want to tell you that it is the most important requirement of all. God requires humility. And you say, well, how can that be? And here is how it is. If you're going to come to Christ, and if you're going to be saved, you're not going to get there by saying, I don't need to be saved. You're not going to get there by saying, I have done all these wonderful and good things, and I've done all of this. And maybe you have, and maybe you haven't. But you're not going to get there that way. You have to understand that the Bible says that all have sinned. Now some people will look around and say, well, I'm better than that person over there. And they might be. And there might be a group over there that they might be better than. Uh, I just think about one time a, a group went up to heaven. They entered into heaven. They came to an area there. There was a little wall. And the one that was leading around on the tour said, now you have to bend down here. And so they all bent down and, you know, we went by and got past the other side. And they said, uh, somebody said, well, why do we have to do that? And he said, because that's where the Church of God and Free Will Baptist people are. And they think they're the only ones that are up here. <laughs> and, uh, but you won't get to heaven thinking that you'd be there because of your goodness or because of what you've done. And why did God send his son? And why did Jesus lay down his life? Why did he do that? If there had been any other way to provide heaven for us, don't you think God would have done it? But there was no other way. Even Jesus himself asked the Father and said, Is there any other way? If so, let this cup pass from me. 
But then he said, nevertheless, as thou wilt. It was the only way that Jesus had to go to the cross. And why did he have to go to the cross? Because we have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. And that is the very first step in salvation. You come and you humbly acknowledge your sin. You acknowledge you've gone your own way. You acknowledge that you've pushed against God. And then you just break. You just let it break. And you give yourself to God. And he comes and fills you with his love. And then you have the fruit of the Spirit. If you never accepted Christ, I invite you to come to him today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, I invite you to stand with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. I thank you for your word, and I thank you that it is true. And Lord, I do pray that uh, you would uh, be with us, all of us. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would remove pride from our lives. And uh, Lord, that sometimes it takes uh, desperate measures to remove pride from our lives. Lord, I don't wish harm on anyone, but I do thank you that uh, whenever things pull us down in those ways, it can be used 